Hi there, and welcome to this Spud Smart webinar on practices for mitigating soil compaction. My name is Carrie Belanger, and I'm the editor of Spud Smart Magazine and SpudSmart.com, and today I'll be acting as your moderator. Although farmers understand soil compaction is an important issue, they are now becoming more serious than ever about its management. Compaction can threaten potato plants in a number of ways. Farmers must often make the decision to enter a field when conditions don't lend themselves well to compaction prevention. However, a holistic approach throughout the year, employing the latest strategies will ensure the effects of soil compaction are minimized year in and year out. I'd like to thank our sponsors, McCain Foods and BASF, for their support. I'd also like to take care of a few housekeeping items at this time. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on spudsmart.com following the event. For audio quality purposes, all microphones have been muted with the exception of the speakers, but we do welcome your input. If you have a question or comment, please share it in the chat box. Today we have two guest speakers. Jody DeYoung Hughes is a regional extension educator with the University of Minnesota, and Matt Ramsey is a director and operator of Oyster Coal Farms in Prince Edward Island. Today, we plan to cover the causes and negative effects of soil compaction and soil compaction prevention strategies and best practices. Please type your questions and or your comments into the chat box at any time during the webinar, also indicating to whom the question or comment is directed. At the end of the complete slide presentation, there will be an opportunity for each guest speaker to answer the questions posed in the chat box. Jody Dion Hughes has been a regional extension educator with the University of Minnesota for more than 23 years. Her area of specialization includes tillage management systems, soil compaction, and soil health management. She has published many fact sheets and peer-reviewed journal articles and has presented at numerous statewide and regional meetings. She has organized the Conservation Tillage Conference and Strip Tillage Expos throughout Minnesota. She works primarily with producers, ag business, government agencies, and crop consultants in western Minnesota and the Dakotas. The floor is all yours, Jody. Hi, uh, like Carrie said, I'm Jody DeYoung Hughes and I work in Wilmer, Minnesota with the University of Minnesota Extension. And today my title is uh, Soil Compaction, Are You at Risk? So I have received a, a lot of questions about um, wheel traffic and you know, compaction and ruts and, and what can we expect from that? And the other funny thing about uh, farming is that when you go by a field and, and you can see it's all uneven, especially like with corn, you're like, oh, wow, you know, that's really uneven. We're going to have some problems. And then as corn gets taller and you can't see it from the road, you can't see past the second row, then um, we say, oh, it's all evened out. Looks good. Well, in the next four slides, we're looking at field traffic. And on the next one, you can see that, uh, you know, we have, it shows up all year round. So even if you can't see it from the road, you can see it from the air. And if you have drones, this is an excellent way to see how things are happening. So this is slide one in Minnesota. And the next slide here, you can see nutrient deficiencies and you can see the diagonal wheel tracks as well as the ones going straight across the field. So these operations are showing up for a long term. They're not gone just with tillage or, you know, in the next couple of years. Slide three, it shows a silage harvest where they're making turns around in the middle of the field. And you can see there that uh, compaction will stay there for quite a while because the other thing about silage is that uh, you gotta get out there when the corn is ready to go, not when mother nature is ready. And then on the last one, you can see this is really quite a widespread problem. And these things do affect your field for a very long time, and they're affecting yield. Just because you can't see them from the ground doesn't mean it's not happening. And then on the last slide there, this is <laughs> one of my favorites, which if I have a favorite photo, that means that that poor farmer had a horrible field. Um, but they're showing the, the tracks here. You can still see the tillage tracks or the combine tracks. Uh, here we cut our, our 
um, soybeans at an angle because it just feeds better into the, the wheel. So what is compaction? What is it and what's it causing to our soil? And mainly, um, it's just a reduction of pore spaces. So if you look at this photo here, it's actually from um, Alabama. And in Minnesota, we're very happy that we don't have these soils here. These are very compacted. You can see the um, hard pan there underneath the roots. It's about an inch or two thick. In the middle between the rows, you can see um, wheel traffic. And this is not the type of soil that we have in upper U.S. and, and even into, the, into Canada. So as you go to the next slide, you'll see that there's uh, what compaction is, is that reduction of pore space. And so the brown is showing uh, soil particles, the blue is water, the white is air. And in an ideal soil situation, you would have about 50% sand, silt, and clay, and 50% pore space. And in that pore space, half of it would be filled with water, and half would be filled with air. And that's an ideal growing condition that's great for microbes, roots, everything, um, oxygen exchange. And then when you compact the soil, like on the right, what you're doing is you're taking out air. You can't squish out water, so it's air space that you're losing. And that soil will stay wetter longer, um, and it, there's a lot of problems that can happen with a soil that's uh, saturated like that. On the next slide, you'll see that in soil structure is our number one defense against soil compaction. It's um, what I try to help everybody build because it just helps with a lot of problems and woes out in the field. The soil on the left is looking at a well-structured soil, and in full defense here, this is uh, under grass, permanent grass. So this isn't something you would see in our farming systems where we do any tillage, but what it shows is the, the extreme of what you can have out there, and a, a good extreme, something that we, we shoot for, but no, in a tilled system, we're, we, we're not going to receive this. But you can tell that if it rained on top of the soil, the water would get through it very, very quickly. You have a lot of large pore spaces to help that water get down. You have poor, uh, smaller pore spaces to help hold on to that water for later on in the season. You could tell that uh, it would be harder to move with water or wind for erosion problems. But the soil on the right has been moldboard plowed for uh, quite a few years in a row. This one, you can see the root is having an extreme problem trying to get through the soil. It's following down cracks as best as it can. If you see a root that is flattened and trying to get through cracks, or if it's really bunched up like that, it's really trying to get the reserves ready to try to push it through that soil. You can also tell there's not a lot of uh, side smaller root hairs. So they're not exploring that soil as best they could. They're not getting the nutrients and they're not getting the water that they could receive. Again, on a soil like this that's well compacted and has very little soil structure, uh, it would blow very easily in the wind. You have a lot of fine particles and very small pore spaces. It also washes away easily with water. All those aggregates that you see in the soil with the micropores and the, you know, the large pore spaces, the small pore spaces, that those aggregates act like mini columns in the soil that help hold up the weight of equipment. So it's your number one natural defense against compaction. And the more tillage you do, the more these break apart and the more you're set up for compaction. So if you go to symptoms of compaction, what are they? Well, the biggest one is that you're going to get decreased root and plant growth. And there's different types of compaction. The red circle shows where you're having wheel traffic, but there's also surface compaction. That's where, you know, the soil is thick on the top and you have a hard time with a seedling emergence. The wheel traffic, you get a lot of compaction underneath that. That I see in soil pits in every soil pit I go to in the summer. I can always find wheel traffic. And then below that, if you look at the root where it's taking an L to the, the left, that's where you have a tillage pan or a plow pan, something hard down there that it's trying to get around. And then the deep subsoil compaction, but we don't work with that very often. Um, that's a whole kind of different talk. When you look at this plant, on the left side of the plant is showing unrestricted root growth, and on the right side it's showing where we do have problems. The 
with the wheel traffic, the hard pans, that type of thing. Something to remember that we do have control of is your uh, pounds per square inch or what your tires are inflated to. We'll put an intensity onto the soil and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. And also our axle load really does the depth of the compaction that's out there. So PSI and axle load are the things that we want to look into here pretty soon. Compaction can last a long time in a soil. So the one that you see on the left, that's a non-compacted soil. And what now we can do is take CT scans of our soil. Kind of like we do for our health, we, we also do this for the soil. And the white is showing the pore space in that soil. So on the left, you can see that there's large pores, small pores, and that they are continuous from top to bottom, or quite a few of them are. And what that helps with, just think if you poured water onto that one on the left, and it would really get through there very quickly. Whereas on the right, they had heavy equipment on the soil. And this is taken 29 years later. This one is showing how long that soil compaction can last. Now, it depends on your soil. If you see that your soil cracks in the summertime, you know, when it gets really dry and it cracks open, then you have a shrink swell type of clay and that will help alleviate compaction over time. But it, it is showing that this can be a real long-term source and that maybe we're having compaction problems or effects from compaction and we just don't know it because that's kind of our background of what we're used to. When you have all those small particles, they can wash away very easily with uh, wind and water. And you can you also see where it's compacted that where the water can't infiltrate, especially if you're on a slope, then it will take the soil hill with it. You can get uneven planting depth in emergence, so especially with potatoes or root crops. Um, you get this problem where you know your uh, potatoes will emerge at different times, and they can be up to 10 days later from each other, which can really uh, <laughs> create some problems around harvest time and with hilling. And it really hurts with effective timing of when you go out into the field to do what you need to do. Remember when you reduce your pore space, you have a lot more water in the soil. And so the soil stays wet and cooler in the spring for longer amounts of time. And this can really cause problems with seedling diseases and root diseases, especially early on in the season. Another thing that can happen is nutrient deficiencies. Because there's less water can be less water available. There's two things going on with compaction. One, the soil is wetter longer, uh, but then when it does dry out, it can't take water very quickly. So later on in the season, you can see nutrient problems because um, your root is not able to extract that water from that compacted soil. So you'll end up with problems, some nitrogen deficiencies and also with potassium deficiencies. In a saturated soil, what you end up with is nitrogen denitrification. And what that means is that where you have a saturated soil, you have microbes working that are taking the nitrogen form that your plants need and turning it into a gaseous form that can actually go back up to the atmosphere. And you can lose two to four kilograms per acre per day when you have saturated soil conditions. And all of us need nitrogen for our crops. And this is something that um, is invisible but happening in the field. When you have a compacted soil, you're going to need more power. You're going to need uh, you know, a much higher engine capacity just to be able to get through the soil to plant and to do tillage. When you're going through the soil, it uh, will have much more wear and tear. The soil is more restrictive, and it, it just takes more to get through that soil. And from the studies with compaction, you can see anywhere from zero to a 60% yield decrease. It is variable, though. That's why it's zero to 60%. Some years, there's just no problems with compaction. And other years, um, it, and I'll show you a study of what can trigger compaction to kind of rear its ugly head. Other effects for compaction, especially with the potatoes, is that you get smaller tubers because they just can't push through the soil. They're lower quality. They'll have higher water needs. Um, especially if you have crusting on the surface, the water can't even get into the soil, so you'll have to probably put out the pivot a few more times. And then when you have the soil clods with harvest, you end up with a lot more bruising. 
What are some of the causes of compaction? The number one thing is working the soil when it's wet. And sometimes we can't help this, but sometimes we could wait a day or two, and especially if no rain is in the future, to, to get out there and really try to work the soil when it's in better working condition. The other thing is excessive tillage. And the reason why this causes compaction is because it breaks apart soil particles. And remember, it takes away the aggregates and the structure and forms it more into um, individual particles, which collapse in on themselves and form compaction. And this is, again, showing that same picture from before, that the more tillage that you do from the left to the right, the more compacted a soil gets, the less pore space. The other thing is minimal crop rotation or carbon inputs. So uh, residue, manures, green manures, those are all great things to put back to the soil. Root crops and you know sugar beets and potatoes and uh, silage, uh, sweet peas, sweet corn, all of those really take a toll on our soil. So what we need to do is when we're not in that not in that crop and we're in a different part of the rotation, is really try to take care of the soil during those times to kind of offset what happens when we have to grow these other crops. The yeah, next one is the weight of field equipment. I mean, uh, the heavier things are, the more they compact the soil. So as you look at this, uh, this is a, adapted from 1958, but it, it still holds true today. And what it shows as as the load increases, and this is a, a cutout of a tire from, you know, and looking into the soil. And that's the depth of the soil down to two feet. And you can see that um, the larger the axle load, the deeper that compaction goes into the soil and the more intense that compaction is. So if we want to really look at weights of our equipment. I know we've been going bigger and bigger, but that's not always better. This one is showing that as your axle weights increase, the depth down into the soil that it affects also increases. So if you're at four ton an axle, you're about 12 inches, and, it, it, and 16 ton an axle, you're at 24 inches. But this is very dependent on soil moisture. Again, the number one thing is if you're out there when it's wet, you're going to compact deeper and more intensely into the soil. This chart's just showing different equipment that's out there and the weights that they are axle load, and this is U.S. tons. And as you look at, you try to stay below 10 ton an axle load. That keeps the compaction in the top foot or so um, of the soil, and that way that that's something that you can still work on. So this is looking at different ones. And if you notice here, the Class 9 combine at 590 horsepower and a 360 bushel capacity is 20 ton an axle load. And some of our equipment has actually gotten a little lighter because we've gone away from using metal and steel to using uh, plexiglass and, and, and things like that. So that is, has helped a little bit with weights, but then our capacity has gone bigger and it's done the opposite. Now, if you look at some of the four-wheel drive tractors that's highlighted at the bottom, this is 530 horsepower. This is, this is a quad track from uh, Case. And it is 18 ton an axle load. So you're looking at your tractor is almost the weight of a combine that's full of grain. And, you know, the combine we know are, is going to compact the soil because we're out there. We have to. But it's fall and usually fall is a little drier, although the weather changes have kind of <laughs> messed with that. But if we're taking a tractor out there, that's the same weight as our combine. We need to be really, really careful with that. Another thing with wheel traffic here, this is uh, where somebody took out a windbreak that's on the left where you see the soybeans are taller. Um, and then in between, that's where he drove the traffic. He controlled the traffic and you could tell the beans there are only about knee high and where he had no wheel traffic, the beans were almost waist high. And you can see here that he had a 23% yield loss by where he drove. But if he would have drove all over the field, it would have been worse. This is definitely not recommended. Um, <laughs> I know it's showing that we're having great yields out there, but uh, yeah, bigger is not better. So this study here is looking at, um, we're going to look at compaction from Minnesota all the way to Quebec. And the reason why they did it across the U.S. into Canada that way is because there's a rainfall difference. 
from Minnesota in Lamberton, we get maybe 25, 27 inches of rain a year, and Quebec is um, not quite double that, but it, it does go way up. And what they did is they compacted the entire field. So if you look at the picture behind, you can tell they went over the entire field. And they did this with 20 ton and axle loads. Now in Lamberton, when they did it in the fall, um, it was dry out. And actually, there was no yield hit on this the next year. But in Wasika, it was wet. And we're going to look at the data from Wasika. So the study in, in Wasika looked at 20 ton and axle load, and it compacted again the whole field. And it did it in the fall and then looked at corn yields, continuous corn, for the next five years. And what you can see here is in the first year, they had a 30% yield decrease where they compacted the soil versus where they didn't compact the soil. And the line up there with the green same yield is showing that if it's anywhere near that line, then it was about the same as non-compacted. So first year, a 30% yield hit. And then you can see within five years, it was about back up to where it was. And so you may hear people say, hey, in five years, Mother Nature corrects herself, everything's fine. But Ward Voorhees, who did this work, said, you know, I'm not quite sure about that. And so he wanted them to look at it going out even further. The other thing to note on here is they did 20, 20, 20 ton and axle load in the fall and then had nothing heavier than five ton and axle load after that. So if you click on the next one, you'll see now he's looking at um, the years following that. And he told the crew there, because now he's out of money, you get five years. And he told the crew, if you see a difference in the height of the corn out there, please go out and take a yield check. Well, if there's no height difference, then don't. So in like 87, 89, 91, and 92, there was no height difference. And so they're assuming that they have the same yield. There is a study showing that there's about an 89% correlation with height and yield with the Siam hybrid. Now in 1988 though, we had a drop again in our uh, yields and 90 and 93, which were extremely wet years. And 1988 was a, an extremely dry year here. And so if everything is going well in the field and uh, timely rains and well-placed fertilizers, you may not see the effective uh, compaction. But if you um, have a, other stressors on that plant, like too wet, too dry, or something else, you will see compaction again. So over these 12 years, remember, he only compacted once. And everything else was very light equipment after that. He saw a 6% yield decrease. So like I said, we may be operating at a lower yield potential just because we're used to it because of the compaction we have out there. The myth is to spread out the compaction because that way, you, you know, it's not very much all over the place. And really that only helps when you're driving by the road and it makes you feel better because you can't visually see it. And if you look at this diagram, it shows all the different ways that you're on the field. And some people go, oh, I'm not on there that much. This photo here shows that we are on that field a lot more than what we think we are. And the way this one came about is it's continuous corn and it has a corn rootworm issue. So anywhere that the corn rootworm could survive, which was in the nice soft soil, uh, non-compacted soil, it would uh, chew on the roots and anywhere that it was compacted, so the headlands or tire tracks, it did not survive and could not establish. And then those roots were not eaten. So when the wind blew, it blew down anywhere where the corn rootworm was, but not in the compacted areas. Now, you may turn this around and say compaction is good, but um, <laughs> you might want to think about that a little bit. Most of the time, our compaction happens in the first pass. Almost 80% of the compaction happens the first pass. So really, really try to use that to your advantage. And that's why we come up with controlled traffic farming. And Saskatchewan is leaps and bounds ahead on doing this. Uh, the U.S., we're still playing around with it a little bit. Um, there's certain systems that it works better in than others or easier to implement. But uh, it is something to really think about when you're out there in your fields and you're buying tires and, and the widths of your implements. That brings me to tire pressure. You want the biggest, largest tire that you can get out there. We had a field day 
where we have Tim Broadbeck was out there with Firestone. Now he's with Precision Inflation. On the left, he's looking at a properly inflated tire, and on the right, it's overinflated. And if you look at the overinflation, you can tell that it just doesn't have as large a footprint and not as many lugs are on the ground, so it's not, it won't be able to have as good of traction either. When you look at the lugs and where they are in the soil, where it was properly inflated, it only went down about five centimeters. Uh, where it was overinflated, it went down almost double to nine centimeters. So it, just by changing and looking at your tire inflation, properly inflating them can really help out. So how do you remedy compaction? Well, there's naturally and manually. And let's look at naturally first. Like I uh, mentioned earlier, if you have a soil that cracks in the summertime when it gets dry, then um, that can help it recover. So the picture on the left is showing a knife is stuck into a plow pan. And if you look on the left, there's a darker crack on the side. That's showing it got dry and it will start breaking through it. But you can't tell Mother Nature where to crack. Um, so it takes a while for this to really help take care of compaction. And then the one on the right is a, a Fargo clay soil and by Fargo. And this one can crack down to four feet, so over a meter deep into the soil. And it, it, it's really helping doing your deep tillage for you. Another thing that you can do that's more of a natural way to break up compaction is expand your crop rotation and diversity and also put in cover crops. This helps build soil structure. And again, member soil structure will help us with uh, future compaction, helps with water infiltration, just really helps out the soil. For potatoes, um, it is really important to have a three to four year crop rotation. And if you can use a brassica as a cover crop or a green manure crop before you put in those potatoes, one, it has um, a disease a suppression and that can be vital for you. And if you look to the right, you can see the taproot can help break up uh, the hard pans that are out there and then also make these huge holes. We actually don't like the huge holes. So if you're going to use the tillage radish, we like them planted closer together so that they make smaller holes, but they still pop through and work on that compacted layer. And then if you use the fibrous roots, like down at the bottom of the, the pictures there, that really helps build structure. Those um, glues and sticky stuff that comes out of those roots help bind the soil together and help really form structure. So both of them together do a great job. Now to re remedy compaction manually or mechanically, first you need to know where that compacted layer is because you don't want to have to take in equipment any deeper than what's necessary. One, it takes a lot of fuel, wear and tear on the uh, tractor and on the implement, and it will set you up for deeper compaction. So if you destroy structure with your tillage deeper and deeper, you're going to sink deeper and deeper as you, as you, um, when it's wet and you get rutted into the soil. So what you want to do is dig a pit, but you don't need to make it three meters deep. Um, <laughs> he just got a little carried away and you can tell how proud he is of the soil pit. Uh, but what you want to do is maybe a meter and you look, you can even do it with a shovel and just go down a half a meter too. But you want to sh find out where that compacted layer is and then set your shanks on the machine that you're going to use only, you know, at two to five centimeters below that compacted area. No more than that. And the reason why this is a, a lit review that Anthony Bly did from South Dakota State University and he looked at corn, beans, and wheat and if deep tillage helped yield. But some would say yes and some would say no and it's like, well, how did this, how do we figure this out? So what he did is he divided it up into, well, did they even have a restrictive layer? And so you can see here with corn, if you did or did not do site, uh, deep tillage, and then look over in the last column and you can see, was there a restrictive layer? So if there was no restrictive layer, there was no change in yield. If there was a restrictive layer or compaction, then yes, it did help. And same with soybeans. If there was no restrictive layer, no change in yield. If there was, then yes, it helped. 
and same with wheat. Exactly. So what this is showing is if you don't have a restrictive layer, don't go doing deep tillage. It doesn't help on yield, and it also uh, destroys more structure deeper into the soil. When you're going to go out there, work the soil when it's wet. This person did not. And, well, in, in his defense, it's really hard to make sure that your whole field is ready to, to go with deep tillage. So uh, certain low-lying areas are going to probably stay wet. But what this did was just smear the soil. You want to use the most non-invasive straight shank. So either A and maybe C, but not B. Uh, B, what's going to happen is you get the soil at the tip, it's going to, and you move through the soil, it's going to move up the, the parabolic shank there and roll over. And that's a good way to bring your subsoil up to your topsoil and um, you don't want to do that. So you either go, you go in there with a straight shank. And again, set it at the depth you really need, not at the depth that it comes from the manufacturer. Now, once you rip this soil, you've, uh, you know, decreased the soil structure in there. And if you drive on it, it's going to be easier to sink into it. So what you want to do is use controlled traffic practices after that as best as you can. So to manage your compaction, one, stay off of wet soils as best you can. I, I totally understand that there's times we just have to be out there. Another thing that I didn't mention too much about, but rotational tillage. So in some years, if you don't have a lot of residue out there, do lighter passive tillage. If you have heavy residue out there and you're not comfortable with it, then you go a little bit deeper and you do the two passes, fall and spring. But anywhere that you can get away with just doing a spring pass or just a light vertical till or strip till, uh, that would be the best for building up the soil. You want to decrease your axle weight. Try to stay under 10 ton an axle load. That's U.S. tons. And reduce your field traffic during a wet harvest. So this is showing, it showed up on yield maps where they drove the trucks throughout the field. I, I like this photo, it's pretty. Again, if I find pretty photos out of your fields, that means that um, you're not liking your field very much. You want to properly inflate all your tires. Um, you want to try to get bigger tires out there and more axles. The more you can do that, the less pressure you're putting onto the soil. You want to diversify your crop rotations, and this is really important with root crops, because root crops just lend themselves to less residue out there, uh, more tillage, more soil disturbance to get the root out. And so, like I said, try to make up the soil health things during the other years when you're outside of the root crop. So this is your number one defense against soil compaction. You really want to try to build your soil structure as best as you can. So the big thing is, is that structure is your number one defense. Tillage destroys your structure. And 80% of the compaction happens on the first pass. If you kind of keep these things in mind, along with axle load and PSI, you can help minimize what's going on out there. Now, our root crops are a challenge. Um, and I like potatoes and I like sugar. So, you know, I hope you still keep growing potatoes and sugar beets. But let's, uh, let's try to help the soil during those times. Again, work on soil health during the other rotations. Double up your tillage passes or any passes that you can put together. Put them together and so that you have less passes out on that field. Uh, this may be a time that you need to get creative. Reduce your tillage depth and your aggressiveness. So the more shallow you can go, the better. Uh, sometimes with potatoes, maybe you're trying to go deeper than what a potato would even grow. So you don't need to break it up down that far. Just go as far as you need to. If your soil cracks in the summer, it's doing deep tillage for you. Incorporate the cover crops and green manure wherever you can. Some crops lend themselves better to that than others. Check your axle loads and tire pressure. And if you got any questions, you can go to our extension website, or you can find me on Twitter, or you can email me. Thanks so much, Jody, for your presentation. Our next guest is Matt Ramsey, who is a director and operator of Oyster Coal Farms Limited in Kensington, PEI. Oyster Coal Farms is a fifth-generation farm and is also owned and operated by Matt's father, John, and brothers Ben and Michael. 
At the farm, the Ramses grow 500 acres of processing potatoes and 400 acres of grain, as well as organic potatoes, peas, and hemp. Matt is active with the Kensington North Watershed Association, sits on the board for the PEI Soil and Crop Improvement Association, and is a director with the PEI Organic Producers Cooperative. Please take it away, Matt. Thanks, Carrie. Um, I'd like to uh, share what has worked on our farm and what we've learned so far. And uh, we're we're still early days yet, so it's mostly observation and hunches. But I'll I'll share what we've been through and and uh, feel free to ask any questions that you might have. The big question that we asked ourselves to begin with was what are the different kinds of compaction how serious are they given our different soil type and uh, are there any ways that we can either mitigate or manage that um, so really for pei conditions we, we have surface crusting as one kind of compaction we can have tillage layer compaction that occurs from traffic in the, you know, the, the more shallow layer of soil. Traffic, maybe even, you know, really heavy rains uh, can create some of that as well. The soil will almost sink, especially after it's been tilled. Um, then we have plow pan compaction, which is a common uh, smearing that I think is seen in many different uh, agro systems. Um, and then a big one for our area is subsoil compaction and whether or not it's having an effect on productivity in our area. Um, so we've we've identified that we do have some tillage layer compaction that we think we can manage um, on our farm and that's primarily being managed through using GPS tram lines. That's, that's probably been the forefront initiative that we've taken on to uh, you know to try and mitigate compaction that we know inevitably going to happen when you get late wet springs cold soils and you're forced to get out there a little bit sooner than you know than you want to be but um, when you consider the correlation between planting date and and yield you come to a point where you have to go anyway so trying to manage that has been something that uh, we've put a lot of work into and, and we've just started down that road within the last year so in addition to the the GPS tram line approach we're taking with our potato crop, um, we've also been doing a little more digging in the springs, and we are noticing that in in places we can we can actually see the imprint of the tillage implement we used in in what would probably be the B horizon or the deeper layer underneath our top eight to twelve inches that that is a lot more a lot more clay particle a lot more compacted to begin with um, we've we tried to you know to some degree of success uh, using a vertical tillage implement on a tram line to try and get a little deeper under the traditional tillage layer and maybe uh, open up some air area for roots and or water as well as air so um, we've only done tr limited trial work on that and there's a lot of thought around here that that some of the subsoiling or vertical tillage that happens here is not being uh, very effective because of the way that our soil is structured. So I've recently spoken with one of our uh, local AAFC scientists and he was digging up some work from years ago and what they're finding or what they had found was that our B horizon is actually quite forgiving. That in total we have a you know a good volume of soil or more than we would traditionally think that given the the winter frost thaw cycle is uh is able to come out of its tightness and go back into it really without creating a lot of long term issues so um, we've been leaning more towards uh trying to just go with that and, and focus more on what we can do in the area that we know our roots are going to get to. Um, but that being said, it appears as though that depth is is deeper than we thought. So there may be some opportunity to use more vertical tillage and and focus it right on our rows to um to open up that B horizon a little more and hopefully increase the rooting depth, uh, water access, etc. 
Um, in addition to that, um, things like surface crusting are are often a function of luck and when you tilled or planted and when the rains came. But uh, we do have some shallow tillage equipment on the farm that is is useful for for small seeded crops uh, to to kind of scratch that up and again let some air get through and uh, and allow young seedlings to emerge. So I think that's probably the whole of what we've been doing practically speaking but but the other side of that is is again still trying to figure out what's pinching us up the most is there is there yield loss due to a particular kind of compaction and uh and are the practices that we're using producing measurable results there's there's a few different methods that have been used here um there's electric penetrometers which measure pressure um, at various depths, uh, they're quite expensive, and and as a result, they're not very popular on the farm. Though they're used quite readily in in research projects. Um, through our local watershed group, we we um, had an initiative where we used a much cheaper tool and had the data calibrated to an electric device, so that if a farmer wanted, they could have the local shop manufacture one of these uh, drop hammer penetrometers go out to the field and collect some data and and convert it into um, the form necessary to calculate what the root penetration would have been um, so then we have the ability to produce maps if you pair that with gis data um, the other tool is a shovel which i think we've all known for a while now um, just going out and digging and having a look and if if you see something that looks like it might interfere with rooting and you think you can either fix it or prevent it from happening. I mean, that's really where we're at now. And I, and I think it's, it's probably where some of the research scientists were many years back when, when this kind of work was looked at and then, and then passed on for other things. So um, you can be really practical about going out and assessing compaction. And the, the only, the only trick is that if you don't dig deep enough, you might miss other things like whether or not the subsoil is, came around after the winter or whether you feel like you can actually do something in there. I mean, again, instinct is, is probably your best tool when, when it comes to that kind of thing. So um, other than that, there's, there's nothing other than some of the emerging technology like uh, electrical conductivity that can actually develop high resolution data across a whole field and identify things like plow pan layers and, and, tillage layer compaction and probably subsoil compaction as well. Um, as far as the plow pan, depending on the implement you're using, you can either accept that that's going to happen, you can try to change the implement up, or if, if you have the luxury, uh, waiting for drier conditions, I think is is never a bad idea if it won't, if it won't impinge upon your productivity on the other end. Um, on our farm, we've we've put a lot of emphasis on on mitigation and one area we felt we could make some change was on the weight of our tractors um it's it's again it doesn't come without its negative consequences considering everything is getting bigger but we uh we had a group here from quebec a couple of years back and they had some numbers on per axle loads and where they thought we should be and we realized that a lot of our smaller tractors were actually well below that threshold while some of our bigger ones were getting pretty close to it especially when you get into wet soil and and the plastic plasticity properties actually change so it, it i think it's it's the heavy tractors in wet soil that we're primarily concerned with um, if everything's dry you know there's there's still a lot of weight you can put on the soil but we've tried to keep our tractors under a certain weight threshold which would be uh, like a John Deere 7810 series type tractor. Um, so just just thinking about weight per axle and what the laws of uh, physics can tell you about what's going to happen when you put those weights on soil. And um, we've all been in a field when it's wet and, and watched the tires sink down a few inches. Well, depending on what you're doing next, that can have consequences for, for what you're going to try to grow there. But it what we're learning is it doesn't always mean 
that there's consequences at the same time. There may be times when you can get away with that, particularly, I think, when you're on tram lines and you know that you're not going to be putting crops directly on that area. We have tried to rebalance as much as we can, and, and that's probably something we're just getting started on. But in addition to the weight, the overall weight of tractor, the the axle on which the most weight is applied can make a difference as well. So we do have some three-point hitch equipment that puts considerable amount of weight on the rear axles. And what we're trying to do is either lighten up that rear tillage equipment, uh, go with tow equipment, or figure out how to mount it on the tractor in such a way that the you know we can help put a, keep a little bit more weight on the front of it. Um, now that can vary with model. There are some tractors that have a different pivot point than the ones we have, but really at this point we're just thinking about how we can take that total weight and best distribute it across the the machine so that if we do hit a bump or we are in a, a wet spot, we're not you know we're not packing soil and you know there's a there's a lot more we can do on that yet. So it's probably more something we're thinking about and trying to manage but uh, we, we also just can't go out and buy buy the brand new fent or or buy the setup that we that we need we have to make it work with the equipment we have so um, it's an ongoing an ongoing effort I guess we we have to some degree started to assess tire pressure um, though none of our tractors are equipped to change on the fly which which does limit you to some degree uh, unless you have a compressor in the field or you're not going very far. Um, there's some great online models that we've been using. One is called Tyrannimo out of the UK and it was introduced last winter by a, a researcher who came here and it will help you calculate your pressures and where they should be for the field. Um, I think that's that has a lot of merit and it's, I think that's getting to the the really fine-tuned end of compaction management we're we're not there yet as a farm but we're starting to assess and at least take note of where our tire pressures are at and and in many cases if you're in a pinch i think the best you can do is split the difference if you can get away with a little less pressure for the for the field then um, then that's what you do but most equipment around here is not set up to make those fine you know fine scale adjustments on the fly which when you're behind on hitting a window, it, it may seem it may seem like an easy thing to do, but in many cases you, you get to the field and you got to be going five minutes ago. So it's probably something that will be more prolific the more you know newer equipment becomes available and and commonplace. So in addition to our some of our implements and and looking at the soil purely physically, we've also utilized um a few I, I guess a select few key crops i would say that we found to be helpful in uh, in keeping at least that tillage layer um, nice and and friable and, and workable um perennial forages seem to be the best uh, the best choice out there as far as putting something in the soil that will actually leave it in a notably different state than than where it might be by just using annuals or or you know different crops with perhaps less vigorous root systems alfalfa if left long enough just has an incredibly um, vigorous taproot that unlike some of the daikon radish and stuff that's being sold now as a compaction option seems to actually stay in the soil and get down underneath those areas that that you're trying to get to um We've tried a little bit of the radishes, but what seems to happen is once they hit a certain amount of resistance, they just grow right back out of the soil and they don't actually get down and get in that that zone there that is gonna you know probably most limit your root growth the the area that's probably just below your tillage um but still high enough that it uh that it has some productivity value in terms of root system and uh and delivering uh, resources to the crop. It's something that we've put a little more effort into over the last few years, but I think perennial forages were always a very traditional part of our rotation. So I think 
when we started moving away from them because of other concerns, uh, you know, for instance, we moved away from red clover because it's a host for, for some pests that aren't so good with uh, potatoes. But I think going back and thinking about some of the other things that those perennial forages were doing for our systems is, is, is worth some merit because the key to changing the, you know, the physical nature of that soil seems to be leaving something to do its thing for an extended period of time. And with perennials, you're talking two and three years instead of one year where you're going to go back in and till. And, and, uh, you know, I think we need to be thinking about the role of tillage in general. Um, you know, in addition to the tillage we're looking at to deal with compaction, we need to look at the tillage that we're utilizing to grow crops as well, because that's also having an effect on, on the aggregate stability of the soil and how well it's holding up. So, you know, one thing that continues to come up time and time again, in addition to your rotation system is getting your tillage frequency down, but the two can be used interchangeably because if you're using perennials, you can leave them a bit longer and you can be mowing them, but you're not actually tilling and introducing a lot of oxygen into the soil. So, so that whole element of, of trying to factor in soil physical structure into your system, I think is, is something we've really probably looked into and, and felt like it had more merit than, than some of the other compaction fighters like subsoiling and, uh, and the like. In addition to soil texture, you know, we have our sand, silt, and clay. The structure and how the organic matter and microorganisms help to bind all that together plays a huge role, I think, in what goes on in the top, you know, the top 15 centimeters or perhaps the top 30 centimeters. When we get heavy wetting events, heavy rain events, especially after we've just tilled, it's those small aggregates and their, their ability to actually hold together that's going to help determine whether that soil is sealed off for roots or for germinating seedlings or whether it's able to retain its structure and and stay the same and in many cases we have some eroded soils on PEI and you'll notice that a freshly tilled soil will sink almost an inch after a heavy rain event so when we're especially in the vein of talking about rotation managing soil so that we can uh, you know know to the best of our ability that we have viable microbial activity and a sufficient amount of organic matter to help that soil retain its structure, particularly under extreme weather events that we're seeing um, with it under a changing climate, then to me that's that's mitigation. That's that's the starting point is is your soil able to withstand some of the forces you know are going to be um, put upon it. And thinking about the need to have air and water and the ways in which those things are held in soils, which is through a balance of pore sizes, you know, macro pores and micro pores, and the the ratio between them really can affect the ability of a plant to get what it needs. So, so I think for me, the 101 is zooming right in on that soil particle and looking at what the root actually needs to deal with it, deal with in order to get what it needs to survive. And, and so to me, I would say that's, that's probably the most beneficial thing we can do in the short term is, is try to make our soil stronger and resilient such that when we till, we know we're burning through some organic matter, but we also know that we're going to be adding some residue back to help offset that. Um, promoting living roots as long as we can during the growing season can help promote microbial activity, which in turn acts as a glue to hold these aggregates together. So some of these really biological things are really deeply intertwined with with the physical properties of soil and i think we need to figure out how to manage both and and get down to the detail of porosity and ratio and bulk density and, and some of these terms which which tend to come and go but but i think they're probably just as important as the npk status of the soil and it's it's kind of early days for us here yet but that's that's a whole other side to looking at compaction is thinking about thinking about the small communities that are existing underneath the microscope and how they're helping to you know to keep the roof up 
Thanks so much, Matt, for your presentation. That was great. Uh, audience, if you have not already done so, please type your questions or comments into the chat box, also indicating to whom the question or comment is directed. And I believe we're going to jump right into some of these questions. And uh, we'll start with you, Jody. Um, and then, Matt, if you have additional comments, uh, please jump in after Jody has answered. Uh, the first question is, I grow potatoes in the Pacific Northwest and we use a rototiller to break up the clods to make a seed bed fine enough to grow the spuds without clods in the hill. We are disturbing the soil structure, but don't see any way around it. How can we avoid or restore this process? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Can hear you. Hear you very well. Okay, great. Um, well, I know potatoes and like I said, root crops are very difficult to do this. Uh, is there a way to line up your rototiller so that it's only doing tillage where you want potatoes, but not in between? Kind of like a strip till where you're uh, rototilling that way. Um, like I said, potatoes are a little difficult, but I know you want to keep those clods out of the hill. Um, you don't want them going through the harvester. So something like that. Otherwise, like I said, you're kind of uh, looking more at trying to build soil health in the other years. I wish there was a great answer. And Matt, do you have anything to add to that? I, yeah, that's a tough one for sure. Um, I mean, we've what we've found is that we're able to deal with a lot more on the harvest end than we thought. Uh, we have noticed that um, since reducing our tillage as much as we can, um, having that fine sand uh, structure in the spring doesn't always pan out throughout the season for us. So sometimes there's a balance between uh, being able to deal with a little more on the harvest end and trying to uh, maintain that structure out of the gate. And so it, it's going to vary with soil type, but for us, we found we can get away with with more at harvest, and that lets us do minimal tillage to uh, prep the seabed for potatoes. Um, but again, that's very, you know, highly variable dependent on soil. Thanks so much. Uh, this next question is addressing Jody's slide presentation. Uh, from the root crops are a challenge slide. Can you elaborate on the point of doubling up passes, Jody? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Sometimes um, you can do a weed and feed together or something like that. Like I said, to, to get creative. Um, is there a pass out there that could be doubled up with something else that you can go out there and do two things at once? Sometimes, a lot of times, that's not possible. Um, you know, like uh, certain herbicides work better if you don't put them with uh, fertilizers. But if something like that can happen, or if you're irrigating your spuds and you can put things through the irrigator and not go out and put it down, that would be a way to do that too. Um, it's just trying to look at what you're doing and minimize the amount of passes that you're making out there. And um, yeah, like I said, uh, root crops are difficult because we need tillage. We need to, um, the harvester, you know, goes through all the soil and, but you guys are the ones that are doing this every day. So I think you could come up with something. And if there's other people in the audience that have ideas, I would love to hear about them because we have a lot of potatoes in Minnesota too. Thanks so much. Uh, this question, um, perhaps both of you would like to address, uh, how will you identify compaction issues by using electrical conductivity database? Anyone? Uh, well, th that work is just being done here now. They think that they can identify compaction layers using uh, like a dual EM type technology. And basically they're driving fields ahead of time and uh, generating very high resolution maps, but I don't think they've fine tuned it enough yet to be able to say for sure that they can accurately paint a picture of where the compaction is in your field. So that's, that's pretty new, which is why I kind of set it as an aside earlier on. It's, it's complex, but it does appear to have some merit in terms of getting maps made for, for very low labor. 
Thanks so much, Matt. Do you have anything to add to that, Jody? Well, I was wondering um, to get those maps, let's say you could accurately find out where compassion is, what would you do differently? Would you then get tillage equipment that also can go by maps where you have the variable intensity tillage or variable um, depth tillage where you would just go do heavier tillage in those compacted areas? Is that, see, I'm asking my own question, but is that kind of what you would be looking at if you wanted to know where your compaction was? Yeah, I, I, any operation I guess you could do variably might be applicable with a map like that. But uh, for example, Mark Stallum, who's a researcher in the UK, was here last winter, and he he computed a metric known as critical cultivation depth using an EC map. So he actually that's what he did. He kind of varied his cultivation depth throughout that field. Um, Again, trying to maximize the productivity of each zone of that field as, as it varied. And uh, they seemed to be pleased with the response they were getting because depending on the, the moisture and the, the type of soil, whether it's a deposition or a hilltop, it makes sense to think about your tillage strategy, um, you know, almost, almost in terms of elevation and, and soil properties like you see. So it's getting quite complex, but that's the general idea is that the map can inform other operations that might be able to vary, you know, tillage depth or in some cases even seeding density and things like that. If if you feel your soil can't support a certain amount of growth, then you may hold back seed rate or something in that area. Uh, does that answer the question, Jody? Uh, yes. Uh, it's just our tillage equipment is just starting to catch up to that. So, um, but that will be interesting to see where that goes. Excellent. Thank you both so much. Uh, we have another question here. How uh, do you mitigate soil compaction issues in a no-till situation? Uh, whoever would like to start with that one, please go ahead. Are you doing no-till potatoes? Because if so, I'd love to hear about it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, compaction with no-till, in the beginning years of no-till, you could still, um, compaction could be quite prominent. Uh, you. What I would do if it's wheel traffic compaction, okay, two things. One, if it's a tillage pan, like Matt said, identify what you have. If it's a tillage pan, I would go through there with a, a straight shank with the subsoiler and get it out of there before you even started no-till. And I would also try to uh, do control traffic as best you can after that. And then if it's wheel traffic, we have, um, we've had a really, really wet year here and what the farmers are doing the ones that are no-till or have built up their soil structure with really reduced till, they do have some ruts out there, but they're only tilling in the ruts. Um, they're not going across full field and they'll take a hit in that area to build soil structure again, but it's, you gotta get it back into shape. Um, if you put in tile lines and then you go no-till, uh, smooth it out before you go to no-till because every bump and is going to be out there and you'll feel it in the tractor every time you go over it. So I'm a big believer in getting everything straightened out first, then starting no-till. And then, you know, um, again, trying to get out there a few days after when it, the soil really is fit to go. And that is difficult. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here. Are you suggesting to put the potato rows always at the same place by GPS when back in potato, back into potato rotation? Matt, do you do that? Um, well, last year was the first year we actually switched to a tram line system. So you can permanently put your rows in one place or you can just ensure that when you're in your potato year, uh, your primary tillage is following the same line as your planter so that at least for that period of time you're having a column of soil that's undisturbed but what we're going to do is ultimately the next time unless there are any issues with hedgerow placements or anything reuse those gps tram lines so that we're continuously farming our potatoes in those areas sort of systematically controlling the traffic so that it's it's not intersecting with where those tubers are growing as much as we can, but in the grain year and in, in the forage year, we're not to a point where we have every implement hooked into that system. That's, oh, oh, sorry. I was say, go ahead, Jody. <laughs> it is a, a 
kind of an all-in system and it can be very beneficial where you have much uh, better soil between the, the wheel tracks. But to build it, I think what you're finding is, you know, you have to change out your equipment. So as you're looking for new equipment, start looking at the the numbers and the widths. But to just change everything over all, all of, in one shot, um, unless you have a small fortune out there, I wouldn't recommend it. Thank you. Uh, we have one last question. Uh, it says, in Europe, stone and clod separating are quite common in some countries like the UK and in Scandinavia. Are you aware of these machines and do you have any comments about their impact on soil structure? I haven't seen them. Um, I'd have to Google them and, and see how much how what they're writing on what their psi is of the machine that's going out there and how much soil they disturb but if you have rocks going into your machinery that's much more costly so it's and the more tillage you do the more those rocks are going to appear too so it, yeah it's always a, a balance uh somebody just called me about a new automated rock picker that it will you fly a drone, it will tell you where the rocks are, and then it will go out there and pick them out for you. <laughs> Maybe it would make the most uh, um, what do you, straight lines getting out there and back. Thank you, Jody. Do you have anything to add to that, Matt? Um, I'm a little bit familiar with with the destoning processes, in the particularly in the UK. It seems to me that they're similar to harvest equipment and that there's chains going through the soil. Um, if if that's what I'm thinking of, then I would expect the effect that that would have would be in the top layer where you're introducing a lot of oxygen and perhaps burning through some organic matter. But um, in terms of wheel tracks, I don't I don't see any it, that it would be any different than a windrower or a harvester or any other implement. Thanks so much, Matt. Uh, well, that appears to be all the time we have today for questions. And I, I would like to thank our guest speakers for sharing their insights and expertise during this SpudSmart webinar on soil compaction. I'd also like to thank our sponsors today, BASF and McCain Foods, for their support. This webinar will be available on spudsmart.com if you would like to view it again. And on behalf of the team here at SpudSmart, I'd like to thank you all for participating, and I hope you have a fantastic day.